were not getting built according to the design. The developer team complained that there was too much changing information and the tickets were too vague. So I started by sitting down with our product managers and narrowing down the features and the milestones that needed to be built. We then broke down the ticket into detailed tasks with clear information and testing criteria, including downstream API and connectivity dependencies necessary for testing. Second, I started an email chain with all the relevant stakeholders listing these tickets and color coding any blockers or delays. I added context on every email by listing out our projected environment integration dates with a buffer and final release dates when our developer resources would end. Thirdly, I listed out what had been accomplished and key members that helped hit our milestones. And it was a huge success. Not only did we make our deadline, but we also found and coordinated uh, with a sister team to take over the project before our development team left. So the project is still alive and well, and new features continue to be added. Finally, how do you handle things when you're being blamed for something? Hopefully the situation will never happen to you, but sometimes you may be blamed for something, whether or not it was your fault. And this can happen whether or not you break prod. You need to know how to address it because it's potentially damaging to your professional reputation. First off, don't take it personally. This may be the hardest thing to do, and this is a great time to channel mittens. Understand what you are being blamed for, by whom, and why. Analyze the various causes of the problem, such as a lack of controls, testing, or communication with the impacted team. Remember to address your accuser's feelings. They may be upset because they have a lot on their plate and the issue came as a surprise. If you weren't previously involved on the project, maybe you were suddenly put on to fit, turn it around, provide everyone with this context when, when you're addressing the problem. And highlight the positives. Maybe we broke beta, but we prevented a major bug from reaching prod and focus on the next steps. Make sure that your manager is on your side and supports you for when your reviews come around. And showcase your plan for fixes and improvements. Win over your accusers by showing them that you are thorough and detailed. Leverage your successes to improve relationships. These tips sound a lot like our advice for what to do when you break prod but you need to repeat, repeat, repeat. It takes time to mend relationships and you won't always see results right away. Consistent behavior is what forms your reputation. Uh, one of the aspects of my managers that I admire most is that they will shoulder the blame for their team. So it's important to learn how to handle blame while maintaining good relationships and a positive reputation. So what did we learn today? I learned a stressful situation can be an opportunity to lead. You can be remembered as someone who made a mistake or as someone who can manage major problems like super mittens. Failure is a sign of growth. Each failure is an opportunity to lead and improve your skill set. Dare to push yourself beyond your comfort zones and practice leading in difficult situations. Look at your failures objectively. Leverage your network, identify stakeholders, and know your audience. Control the communication and dissemination of information. Assess the entire information before fixing the issue. Fix and report, then analyze and investigate all the causes of failure. Showcase your improvements and successes. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and thank you for having us. Click on the Bloomberg links to find out more about Bloomberg and our amazing leaders. If you uh, want to hear some about some more challenging situations, uh, find us on LinkedIn. And we will now take questions from the audience. Let us know if you have any challenging situations of your own or if you'd like to hear more stories. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Cindy and Jenny, for sharing the presentation. I know I definitely learned a lot, and I'm sure that um, all of our participants did too as well. And we had some questions come in the chat, so I'll start with those. So one of our participants asked, 
like how do you stop kind of having wishful thinking or thinking about dreams that aren't necessarily um like actually going to happen per se how how do you guys deal with that uh i think i might need a little bit more context for that but i will say uh i think we underestimate we overestimate what we can do in a day and we underestimate what we can do in our lifetime and i think that's uh that's always been a like a very impactful saying for me. Uh, I tend to uh, sometimes get distracted by other things and reaching your goal can take a long time. Uh, so it's important to know what your goal is and have a visual reminder of what that is. I will usually put up a sticky note that I see every single day, <laughs> uh, especially if I'm working on something and I just remember, uh, just to remember that Anything that doesn't go towards my goal, I should try to cut out. It's like, it's not useful to me at all, whether it's meetings or extracurricular activities. Uh, if it's not one of the things that are important to me, uh, it's not really going to serve me well. Um, I, hope, I hope that answers it, but like, uh, if you were thinking of something else, uh, please let me know. <laughs> I would also add that I think milestones are really important as, Developers, we learn to break problems down into smaller, more manageable problems. And I think that can help you not only reach your goal, but stay motivated um, because we hear no a lot. Uh, I've actually told her, like, even just last uh, semester, I heard, you know, TA saying, you know, if you're having a hard time with linear algebra, you won't want to take deep learning. And so I just spent my break watching videos on linear algebra and it's going fine. So I think um, it's good to get a lot of advice, um, lots and lots of advice. You know, one person might tell you you can't do something, but somebody else says, you know, you don't worry about it. If you work hard enough, you can do it too. I've done it. You can do it. Yeah, no, that was really great advice from both of you. And um, if the attendee who asked the question kind of wants to follow up with more specifics, I can definitely um, relay that back to you. Um, but another question we have, this is also pretty broad, and I think you guys did touch on it a little bit, but if you have any more tips, just how do you integrate feedback into your work? Um, like what's the best way to take that feedback and really use it in a constructive manner? Absolutely. Um, I, feedback is really important, and it's important that you have a regular feedback loop with your manager. Uh, that, this is what one-on-ones -on -ones are for. And I think the first time you're presented with a one-on-one, -on -one, you, you don't know what to talk to, about with your manager because you're still getting a sense of the environment and, um, and even understanding yourself and like what it is that you want to learn. But uh, it's important to uh, be very clear with expectations. Ask them. Uh, what is it that they expect from you? And, uh, and let them know what you expect from them as well. They are there to support you and help you grow. So if there is uh, an area where you want to grow or certain skills, uh, you know, bring that up with your manager. They, uh, they're there to help find opportunities for you to learn those skills. And if you can attach metrics to something, I, I always find that useful in incorporating feedback. Um, like setting little goals like, okay, in this month, I'm going to make sure to talk to more people or get feedback, present, um, and make sure I distill the information down for product differently than I do for tech, for example. Um, and, and so having some sort of information that's coming back to you can be really valuable in incorporating that feedback. Um, a note about feedback. Two, feedback can be very objective. If you ask someone for feedback, you're going to get a whole host of uh, mostly complaints, <laughs> sometimes good feedback. So, um, but uh, a lot of them are objective. So it's important to ask, to know how to ask for feedback. So if you know that there's something that you want to improve, uh, you can narrow it down to that. Or if you are just asking for general feedback, make sure you ask them to provide examples. Like someone might say, you speak too fast, right? And so 
but once they provide you an example, like maybe you spoke too quickly and it was too much information at one time in such and such uh, example, then you can understand where they're coming from and why they were saying that. Uh, so follow-up questions are really important. And just taking, if you take yourself out of the equation, right, it makes you a little less shy and uh, helps you ask better questions to figure out like the root of what someone is saying when they're trying to give you feedback. Yeah, um, related to this, I know <laughs> I keep going back and forth, but uh, I know a lot of people, um, a lot of times you want feedback because you want to grow and you want to showcase that you are growing. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's, it's hard for, uh, like a manager might have a lot of people that they are uh, like, uh, on the team that they are trying to help grow. And uh, it's hard to remember what everyone is doing too. And uh, it's uh, I found it really useful to keep a record of the projects that you're doing and if they're going towards your own personal goals, right? Um, and setting those personal goals. Uh, and, uh, and then at the end of the year, this is something that you can show to your manager. Say, hey, these are the things that I did. This is uh, like how I've progressed and maybe this is where I want to go. It provides them a very clear roadmap and will help them give you better feedback as well. Yeah, that was so much good advice from the feedback loop to just making sure you're asking the right questions and also the importance of asking follow-up questions. So hopefully our attendees are able to take away a lot from your amazing responses. Um, another kind of follow-up question to this is a lot of the advice that you guys are giving was um, kind of more from like a pre-experience perspective, like talking about differences between like prod and like beta, but uh, one of our attendees was just wondering, um, for somebody who's just going to more like entry level intro opportunities, what's the best way to kind of handle these more stressful situations? Uh, I think this, uh, this information does apply if you are new to the, uh, to the industry actually. Um, first off, your, your TL is like your biggest supporter. Uh, they will do a lot of this for you. TL is tech lead. Yes. <laughs> uh, or team lead. Uh, it, it can, it can depend, uh, on your company and their, and their structure, but your, yes, your manager. Um, and, um, and they will sometimes do this, but, um, but it's important to, to remember it because, uh, maybe an issue comes up on a chat uh, and uh, and you might start look in, looking into it, but not say anything to the person that you are looking into it. Uh, and I think that's uh, like, that's just like a simple example of how like stuff starts to break down um, and communication uh, doesn't get disseminated. So uh, it's, I think it's always useful to stop uh, and uh, I, I just, I literally bring up <laughs> these notes and, and make sure I hit, uh, hit every step. Um, but uh, I will say you will break dev uh, and uh, beta and hopefully you never break prod in your life, but it, it may happen. And you know what? It's a good, it, it can be a good experience. Uh, I would also say it depends on what company you're joining and what their process is. Um, the biggest success I've seen with people uh, trying to do prod support is doing a lot of shadowing and making sh like asking your manager uh, for time to shadow before you're added to the rotation. Um, so I've seen people added to the rotation or at least start shadowing as early as six months into, uh, into their employment. And Oftentimes, when you're put on rotation, it can depend on the structure of the of the on call, but you can be on call uh, and looking at pro problems that are not in your code base that are on sister teams, and so you have to learn how to debug, how to figure out what issue it is, whether or not you need to bring in another team like DevOps um, rather early. So. That's why it's really good to shadow, not just people on your team, but people on other teams and see how they all triage. Um, every time I'm on prod support, I learn something new. So 
Yeah. It's good to collaborate a lot, especially early on, because I, you can be put on prod support pretty early, depending on your organization. I think when you also join a team, uh, you, 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 you're, you're slowly introduced into the, into the bigger system, uh, but it can still feel really, really fast. Like the first three months are probably the hardest um, because it, there's just so much to learn. Uh, but uh, understanding how your system, where your system is and like your, where your team sits in like, the bigger organization um, and how things talk to each other is uh, really going to help you when you have to like pull in people and know what to do. Uh, because uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that there is an assumption here that if you are new to the team that you won't break anything or there's gonna be uh, that, uh, yeah, you're not gonna be put on support and have to find issues for other people, but that's, that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, you are going to be put on support. You're expected to look through the tickets. And I think the first time it's, it's kind of difficult because you're looking at other people's code bases and uh, and you might feel stupid because it's hard to follow the code, right? And understand what's going on. And uh, it is it is very important to ask people uh, what's going on <laughs> in these pieces and like how like how they find the answers quickly. Um, one of the best advice I ever got was, uh, don't be afraid to bother people if you need to get something done. Um, just go up to them and don't be afraid to look stupid and ask simple questions. And I've actually had a lot of good feedback in my career um, where people tell me, hey, Jenny, I love having you at meetings. And um, this is coming from engineers that I admire that are very good. And I said, but I spent my time asking such basic questions. And they're like, no, no, Jenny, we all pretended that we knew what was going on. But, you know, once <laughs> when you're in a meeting, I know we're all on the same page. And we all have a very clear picture of how this is going to get built or deployed. So don't be afraid to bother people um, and build those relationships. Yeah, I think um, I, the building relationships is key. Uh, like, for example, I, I don't feel uncomfortable asking my sister like a million times <laughs> to help me with something, whatever it may be. But if there's someone I don't know, you know, I like, you don't want to bother them as much. So that's why I think uh, your your team culture and getting to know your peers is really important because you do gain that confidence uh, in being able to ask them for help. And they, they know you, they know that you're smart. They, uh, they know that you're not, um, that you took the time to look at a problem before going to them. Um, uh, and it, it depends on the situation as to like how long you should look at something. I, I noticed the question about that. So um, if, uh, if it is client facing uh, and it is serious, uh, it is, and especially if you're new, just bring in people right away. <laughs> ask, uh, ask someone else. Uh, usually you're paired up with a a mentor uh, and like and bring them in right away if there are like alarms or other things um, that uh, like maybe are just like false alarms then those are things that you can like investigate a little bit calmer um, but it's important to ask your team as well uh, when it when is a good time to pull others in just so that you're all on the same page uh, I think uh, well, we make a lot of assumptions but it's good to verbalize this Yeah, that was all, again, amazing advice. And I know you already kind of touched on like, how long you wait before asking for help from others. Um, so I, I feel like another question that one of our attendees had was, what are some specific qualities that you guys look for in um, peers or team members? And are there any qualities that you think are most important or not as important relatively? Um, so I feel like this is related to hiring. Um, so, uh, so I think, I think there's, um, and I think when you work with someone, um, is, I, is it related to hiring? Well, because I would say, I would say there's two pieces because some of the qualities that you look for in team members, you look for when you're first interviewing a candidate and it can be different depending on where you're interviewing. So I know some, some areas, right? 
Um, if they have easier sets of questions, they expect the candidates to get the questions right during the interview. But if, uh, if you have harder questions, you really just want to see the person's thought process. Do they ask good questions? And are they interested in learning? I've actually hired somebody that didn't get the right answer. And he was a top developer uh, because he had an interest in understanding how it worked. So when he got the problem wrong and I explained the answer, he really thought about it, um, figured out other similar or alternate fixes um, and asked a lot of questions to make sure he understood the logic um, behind the question. And so he was a great developer. And so I think that's the same thing that is a great quality in your peers. Are they detailed? Do they really seek to understand how your system works? Why certain code is in place and how it connects to everything else? Um, so one of the things I like to do is I like to look at the people that I admire, like my managers, and see how they act and try to emulate their behavior. Uh, so you'll notice lots of managers, they have lots of connections with other teams, but they also understand how all the systems are connected. So I would just go around as an early new hire and sit with different teams and ask them, you know, what's uh what's important in your data pipeline what are the, you know like how does this work how does it connect to the apis that are getting built like when do the batch job run like and how often um how do you like the data lake right <laughs> um or product you know why are we building this feature like is it important how much money is it bringing in like what do you look for where do you get your data from um I think asking lots of questions um, can help you grow because you'll be a better and asset uh, similar to your managers, right? Um, they'll know, you'll know more people, but you'll also know how the systems work and you'll know what to look out for when you get a new project or a bug. Um, it'll also help you triage. Um, yeah, um, I, think, I think to add to that, uh, communication and uh, asking questions and looking for edge cases and curiosity um, are like two major things that we look for. Because if you are asking these questions uh, and you are uh, also explaining your understanding to me, I will feel like we are on the same page and we are working great together and everything's going splendidly, right? So, uh, and I think that's something that uh, is present in when you're interviewing. I mean, we look for the fact that you can code, that you understand your data structures and we will ask questions, right? Um, but uh, a lot of that is, uh, are you verbalizing your thought process? And, uh, and are you stating some assumptions that you're making? Because this is what you have to do on the job, right? Uh, you might say, oh, I'm assuming that this string is sorted. And the, you know, your interviewer might say no, or yeah, 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 it is. And like that might simplify the, uh, the problem. Um, and it clarifies a lot of points. And I think, and, uh, and those are really important qualities um, in any developer. It's the repetition technique. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's all really great advice. And you actually kind of already covered the next question I was going to ask, which is about like any more tips on uh, interviewing besides just asking questions you guys talked about like, some resources just making sure that you are familiar with like, your basic data structures and algorithms um, another attendee just asked in the chat um, basically she's currently doing an internship and she's finding it a little difficult to navigate all the different like tools technologies and code bases that are available to her so do you and she feels like her progress is generally a little bit slow do you have any advice um, in that regard, or is, is there any way she can like, speed up her progress or take better advantage of the resources that she's being given? All right, so in the internship, it's difficult to navigate the tools, technologies, and code bases. Um, I find that it helps to, for me to cement knowledge when I explain it to someone else. So um, I think if you can find a friend and like ask and, and ask them and explain back your understanding, that's going to help a lot. Um, also, um, I think 
you you are exposed to quite a lot in an internship uh just to get up to speed on all the technologies and everything that they're using and it's um and even in the internship period is very is very short and it's normal to feel this way uh first off even uh even if it's not an internship and you join uh join the workforce right the first three months in any company always always feel a little overwhelming so um but yeah, I think sometimes it helps to look uh, if you've already been given a project or know um, a, the specific team that you're being put on, at least you can ask them what is important for you to know to accomplish what you need to accomplish and ask them how that fits in with other things and like what, uh, what are common tools that they use. Um, because those are the ones that you need to learn really well. The other ones uh, like they might, they might not even be applicable because uh, different teams are using different things. Um, and uh, if you feel that your progress is slow, um, I think everyone sometimes feels that way. Uh, and um, you tend to feel that uh, like you're not doing as much as you can or that other people are faster. But uh, first off, I want to say you are joining an industry where, uh, but I mean, before you were just in a group in college, you're just in a group with other people, your other peers that are your age. And now you're joining the workforce where people have been doing this for like 20, 40 years, right? They are masters. Uh, even, <laughs> even some people where you think like, oh, maybe they, uh, maybe they haven't coded in a while. Maybe they're not as fresh. No, they know their stuff. <laughs> they will impress you. <laughs> so, um, I think, um, uh, hmm, what was my point there? Oh, uh, if you feel that you're not doing well, I think it's important to make that roadmap for yourself. And it's, uh, and I would stress in your internship as well, uh, set up mile markers. You're usually paired with someone, set up mile markers for when you should achieve something. Um, it might be a little fast paced in, in an internship. I'm not, I'm not super sure. Um, uh, depending on the size of the project. Uh, some projects you're able to finish, some you're not, it's okay. Um, I know a lot of internship projects that have, um, usually they'll pick the best ones and give it to the in interns, the ones that they want to do them, like engineers want to work on themselves. So like, even if you aren't able to finish it, um, that's fine. It's not gonna, they're not gonna like grade you badly for that. In fact, they're probably gonna take what you've done and try to finish it themselves and then like show it to you <laughs> afterwards when it <laughs> when it's in, in use. So I think, but what is important is the communication, showing that roadmap of where it needs to go and um, and showing what you've done. Uh, just, just writing that down. Even if you're like having like a, a specific problem, you can say, these are the things I've investigated and this is like what's left for this thing. Um, because uh, if you aren't able to finish the problem, uh, you'll be able to hand it off to someone else and they'll be able to understand what you've done so far and be able to pick it up. And I think that's, that's really important. Specifically for internships, I would also say uh, it depends on the company, but I know the companies I've worked uh, with and uh, I hear from Cindy uh, also at Bloomberg that the companies care a lot about their interns and wanna make sure that their interns are learning and go, come away with a positive experience. Um, so uh, we've given our interns like what I would have considered slightly ambitious projects. I'm a little mean. I was like, we should put them to do like test code or, <laughs> or like something, you know, outside. And they're like, no, no, no. We're going to integrate it straight into the app. Um, and they did a great job. Um, I think it can be a little hard on Zoom sometimes to get, um, I, I, I'm not sure, but I imagine if you're just joining a company on Zoom, it can be kind of hard to get uh, access to people. Um, and so I know I would take a lot of time with our new joiners and just sit with them and watch them code, right? Tell them about useful tools. And I know that I really appreciated it when my managers um, or tech leads, they weren't like my direct managers, but they were just like tech leads and very knowledgeable on the team explain to me like, what is subversion? What is Git? How does it work? What's trunk-based development, right? Um, because there were a lot of custom bespoken tools 
uh, that weren't uh, available outside of the system. Um, so I think it's good to, if it's, if it's something that's like open source, watch videos on it. There's lots of, um, I like to watch videos <laughs> as a quick way to learn a new uh, tool or technology, or uh, try to find someone uh, who will take time to sit with you on your team. Um, bother them, I, I would be as mean as saying you want to catch up and then just saying, hey, I have this problem. <laughs> Let me screen share with you. I don't understand it. Because um, it is important to, um, to understand it. And I think people are really good quick source um, for getting up to speed faster. Yeah, I also want to mention, um, I think uh, early on in my career, I was uh, I was really hesitant to go up to people and ask them questions because I felt I was like I was wasting their time, right? And that they would just find me annoying. Um, but uh, after like getting to know people and talking to them, they love talking to me. <laughs> they, they thought it was great, and they think they're also engineers, and they think that these problems are interesting. And sometimes, you know, they, they get stuck on their problems, and they need breaks too. And it's like nice to to switch off to another thing and see what other people are doing. And so I think uh, switching my perception and um, and like telling myself that what I had to say was important because it's important to me <laughs> and I need to find this solution and uh, going and chatting with people anyway um, and thinking that, uh, that what I had to say was valuable and it wasn't wasting their time, I think uh, made me open up to people and uh, feel more comfortable asking them questions and ultimately have better relationships for that. I think before I would just research stuff on my own because I felt like I, I was supposed to know it on my own instead of like looking at it and asking people uh, their understandings. And, um, and uh, people tend to think that you are like uninterested, that you don't care and uh, that that can actually be pretty bad for your reputation. Um, you want to show that you care uh, and that you are looking at things. Um, even if you yourself feel like you're stupid or behind, that's not how people will see you. If you notice masters, they make things look very easy. <laughs> no, yeah, that's all great advice. And I love how you keep on underscoring the importance of asking questions because I think like personally, that's also something that I think is just important. Um, sorry, I'm seeing if there's a new question that just came up. Um, yeah, so she was, uh, one of our attendees was wondering about um, anything you do kind of in your personal life or personal time um, that kind of helps you in your professional life, whether it's like unintended or more purposeful, and then also your views on sunk cost fallacy. And this will probably be our last question for today as well. Oh, sure. Um, so uh, anything that we do in our personal time, I feel like I'm, oh yeah, running. Uh, that is a great stress reliever because it, it'll just build up over the days and you don't notice it. And I like, uh, I like to play loud music and go for a run and I find that that uh, clears my head more than anything. Um, I also noticed most of my managers were marathon runners. <laughs> <laughs> And I noticed I was most productive when I carved out a, a piece of my day to just go running almost every day. Personal health. Yeah. That's when I was most productive. Um, other than that, I feel like um, I, I would always, people would ask me about my hobbies and I, you know, like I have, I, I have some stuff that I do, but a, a lot of times I'm like, I don't know, it's like pretty boring. I just kind of look up and like things, technical things of where I can grow and that I think are interesting, but they're all related to work. And, um, and someone mentioned like, oh, well, you do have a hobby. It's self-improvement, <laughs> right? And um, yeah, I think uh, like I, that's always useful. Um, in terms of the sunk cost fallacy, I may not be familiar with that, but it sounds a little bit like uh, there's a sunk cost sometimes to learning a particular system or technology that isn't transferable. And so I would say that oftentimes learning a lot of the fundamentals can help you learn the other technologies faster. Uh, so that's why 
when you take time to do personal learning, such as like uh, maybe you learn JavaScript really well or, or C plus plus, you know, event driven systems, right? Even though Kafka is like maybe one particular technology and somebody else is using RabbitMQ, learning about how it works and and when it's good to use it and not use it uh, and applying it is is transferable. So there are pieces that are going to be very like language specific. But what I find is if you take time to learn the reasons and the structure and the fundamental building blocks, those are very transferable and will minimize some costs in your learning. Yeah, that's all really great advice. And I know there are a few more questions, but unfortunately, we do have to wrap up the event. But thank you so much to both of you for sharing all your advice and answering the question with such detailed responses. I really felt like I learned a lot from your presentation, but also a lot from just um, all your really insightful answers. And I think that our participants also really loved hearing from you. So thank you again for speaking and also sharing your experience um, with Bloomberg and uh, all of your previous technical experience. I personally learned a lot. Um, and for our attendees, uh, our next block of events starts at 2 p.m. So feel free to check out the pop-in sessions link, or if there's an, another Zoom link, you can pop into that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Reach out on LinkedIn. <laughs>